Make sure you drink. Make sure you drink of that drink that is drink indeed. Withdraw from your presence. We'll make our hearts into words and we adorn your majesty. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. All powerful, all beautiful, all glorious, we acknowledge your presence and we worship in your presence. We humble ourselves before your majesty, O great monarch of the heavens. We make obeisance before you because there is none to be compared to you. We bow ourselves because we know that out of the superfluity of your bounty, you have made grace available to us. We are recipients of your mercy. We are recipients of your compassion. We are creatures of your grace. And so tonight we worship you. From the very depth of our being, springs of worship to adorn thy glory. O oh, great majesty, be glorified. We thank you for blessing us with this weight of your presence here tonight. And every living spirit is drinking of this precious drink that is drink indeed. You have domiciled us tonight in the habitat of your presence. The original place that you have designed that we will function. presence today we ask that this moment be frozen in time so that you can extend to us all the deliverables of grace that you want to equip us with tonight in the name of Jesus thank you father in Jesus mighty name When God created fish, he made a suitable habitat for fish, water. Created plants. He ordained that their anchor will be fastened on land. When he created man, the habitat for man was Eden. Eden was like an embassy. Eden was like a temple. Eden was like a place in the natural where you could interface with the supernatural. It was like a borderline between the invisible and the visible. And the high commissioner of the earth that is designed to manage the affairs of the earth was domiciled right in Eden. That was supposed to be his administrative headquarters where he functions from. This high commissioner was going to be effective to the extent to which he looks upon God's example as it is laid out in the heavens in order for him to implement the same kind of dominion in the earth. The only possibility of accuracy that Adam had in this higher state in which he was placed will be determined by his capacity to interface with the realm of the divine. Eden. 
In order for him to be competent, lectures were arranged for him. And God did not send the angels to lecture him. God came himself in the cool of the day for lecture. Unfortunately, he showed up one day and his student had absconded from lecture. May you not abscond. Came to instruct him. Because the preoccupation of man was to be a miniature manifestation of God upon the face of the earth. The extent to which the, his life was going to be in accurate conformity with God was the degree to which he interfaced. There's no way I look at Eden. I look at the environment that God created for the first man. Without understanding that the extent to which he will function in the capacity that God has invited him was going to be based on his ability to interface. There is a temptation to think that because you came out of Oxford University, you have a PhD there, that you now know how to drive the affairs of your life. There is a temptation. That kind of reasoning is an indication of the fact that you left Eden. You have absconded from Eden. It's when we see him that we know what we look like. You'll be lost if you decide not to look upon him. So what happened to us just now as we journeyed in prayer and in worship was that we, we arrived at Eden. Because Eden is not a location, it's an environment. It's an environment that can be created in your bedroom. When you find that environment, there, there is an unexplainable balance that your spirit assumes. And then you begin to drink of the spirit. It's a journey. And all of these sweet realities take place in a location called the human heart. I salute you in the name of Jesus Christ. So yesterday we began to talk about the human heart. The intersection, that is the center and the circumference of man. That's the place where God conquers. That's the place where God dominates. Because that place becomes your altar. It becomes that interface with which you can make, you can make contact with the invisible, immaterial realm. So if, if something is going wrong in your heart, the implication of the ailment of the heart is that it disqualifies you. It denies you access, access for partaking in the full scope of the divine nature that we received in Jesus Christ. If you need to fight, one of the reasons you, one of the cogent reasons to fight is to fight to protect that heart. Because all of your dealings with God are going to be rising from that platform. And so Jesus, in his instruction, to us on the subject of prayer began to talk about him that dwells in secret. I dwell in the pavilion of secrecy beyond the reach of your physical environment and I desire that you seek me out every day in my place, not in your place. Because as we read further, you'll find out there is an orientation that we must sustain if we are going to prosper in the enterprise of prayer. Please help me tell your neighbor, prayer is life. In the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 6, sorry for not asking you to sit. It's quite difficult to make that request when we know that there are no seats. Matthew chapter 6 verse 6. But when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door. A lot of metaphors are used here because Jesus is an object teacher. 
many, many times, he doesn't speak in simple, plain language. Because what he's trying to achieve is not communication, as it were. It's content. So he traps this content in metaphors. He traps it in deep speeches. It will take you some time with the Holy Ghost to unravel the depth of the things he throws out to us. So in this scripture, Jesus uses metaphors again. He said, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. So there is a closet arrangement. And it will surprise you to know that your, your closet is particular to you. Your closet is yours. Your wife cannot share this prayer closet with you. It's, a, it's an idiosyncratic kind of closet that is so particular to you as an individual. He's saying that when you pray, you will need to enter into that closet. He's still talking about an invitation to beef up com uh, consciousness of the activities that is going on in your heart in such a way that the externalities are shut out. Are you with me? You are not with me. If you achieve what we mean by shutting the door, then you will begin to understand what we call the language of the spirit. Because God does not speak English. God does not speak German. God does not speak Yoruba. God does not speak Igbo. The words that I speak, Jesus said, they are spirit. Except you shut the door, you'll not be conscious enough of the movements of God upon your heart. You are likely to miss his speaking. It is your recreated, regenerated human spirit that has the ability to hear the movements of God, to hear God. You will need to exercise your spirit in becoming conscious to the activities going on in the closet in order for you to pick the frequencies of God. Sometimes it's like a volcano. It's erupting on your inside. But if you don't shut the door, you'll be more conscious of your paycheck than what is happening in the canvas of your heart. Shut the door. That's the place of spiritual warfare because Satan will come like a wind trying to get your attention and trying to present things in your environment as more real as the transaction you're about to have in that closet of yours. The masters of our faith are men that understand the way to that secret place where the Most High dwells. Because the Bible says that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. It is, the place belongs to the Most High, but you can dwell there. There's accommodation to contain you. There's accommodation to take you in. When you pray, Jesus says, get into thy closet and what? Shut the door because Satan is going to come to try to distract you. He will, he will create something. Something like, there's yogurt in the fridge. <laughs> Vanilla flavor. <laughs> it's pink in color. He will fight you to, to, to make sure that you leave an allowance on the door for the sake of the fire. Maybe there's a fire outbreak, so you are trying to um, create safety systems. Jesus says, shut the door. It will take you some time to shut the door. But what happened to us that the presence of God began to fill this place was that unknown to you, you entered into your closet and you shut the door. The next thing that happens when you, that door is shut is that times of refreshing will begin to come from the presence of the Father. Your heart is your altar. It can be broken down completely. And if it's broken down, it means you've lost your alignment between earth and heaven. 
you are going to be a creature that is measured into time the reinforcement of heaven you are going to have to forfeit because you lost your alignment if you must fight then you must fight to keep your alignment in the spirit because your possibilities are tied to the potential that you have on the basis of the spiritual capital that you have received from God shut the door sometimes it takes one hour speaking in tongues for the door to be shut and for you to become conscious of the movements going on in your heart because a spirit being is likely to speak to you much more with signs with with signals with with pictures that's the form in which the language of the spirit is if your door is not shut you come into confusion you will, you will begin to wonder if the thoughts that came from God are your thoughts or God's thoughts. The reason why that confusion is there is because you did not shut the door. And so your capacity for discernment begins to fail. You need discernment more to, to decipher God's movement, God's words on your heart much more than devils and demons. Shut the door. Is, is serious business it's not something that you can do double-minded you must the whole of you must be taken you must set that moment apart and say this is God's moment we don't pick calls here we don't make calls here we don't do whatsapp here we don't do emails here we shut the door I wonder what what has happened to us someone is praying and he's just replying a chat and say okay yeah on Thursday Thursday is a good time. Thursday. The door is not shut. You are not likely to. Yes, you, you are gaining. Your spirit is, is being charged from praying in tongues because God has made it that if by any means you come to him, you'll be rewarded for coming. Just that you came. He that cometh to God, the Bible says, eh, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. So he even creates an allocation of incentive just because because you came maybe you came because of strife you came because you want somebody dead you came because for any reason why you came you, there's an allocation of profit that is made available for your coming in the first place so even if you come with whatsapp and but if the door is not shut you'll not be able to design his movements that means you came to participate how, do, how does it look when you you just wake up in the morning and you tell your wife hey Good morning, today is this, 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 that, that, and then you walk away. That's what you've been doing for a very long time because you don't know that prayer is so big a business that you need to shut the door. You need to get consumed. When, when he notices that you have shut the door, what he will do is that he will suck you into the spirit. Yeah, he will suck you in. Then you become conscious of his movements. Nobody needs to teach you that level of participating in him because your spirit is configured, is wired to be able to talk to him, to, to reach out to him, to cry to him. You know the Bible says that um, that time has come and now is the time when the true worshiper shall worship the Father. Where? So worship is capable only in spirit. It is your recreated human spirit that has the ability, the capacity to engage God. You see, communication within that realm is what the psalmist tried to describe to us as deep calling onto deep. Um, you will need to press a little further in order for you to begin to understand the things that your spirit is transacting with the spirit of God. You need to press a little further. And that's why you profit maximally when you have a time set in your 24-hour day that is not less than two hours, 40 minutes. And the reason for the two hour 40 minutes calculation is that the Bible calls what you say the fruit of your lips. If, if, if what you do with your lips is a fruit, uh, there is what we call the principle of first fruit. That means uh, you, you that belongs to God. You know, there are things that belong to God. Now your first fruits belong to God. So even, uh, I don't want to go there anyway. 
but two hours. So you need to pay a tithe of your 24 hours talking to God. Just talking to him. Just talking to him. And you do that as a matter of duty. When it becomes duty and you know that there is no other use for this time other than talking to God. He will know that you have decided to establish a discipline that will make him favorably disposed towards you. And most of your encounters will come during those moments that you have created. Is there room for God in your life? Is there room? Oh, you are so busy. You are working on two master's degrees. And because of that, you have adequate explanation for your being absent from God's presence. It is Satan that is looking for an opportunity to set you up. Because if an affliction comes upon you, you will stop schooling so that you can recover yourself. Meanwhile, staying without prayer is, is a state of ailment. Because the Bible calls it fainting, your life support. You are, you are hanging on the last strand of the mercy of God. And so he invites us to come into our closet and to shut the door. When you shut the door, he pours out um, the grace to discern. Because God begins to move. You are creating a ripple effect in the realm of the spirit. And there's going to be a response, which is not in human language. And your spirit begins to understand the things that God is bringing as feedback. If you press a little more, your mind will begin to understand. Because the idea is that your entire being is supposed to be part of the prayer enterprise. God will fill up your spirit and the anointing of God will overflow your spirit chamber and begin to influence your thoughts in your mind so that you can begin to think the thoughts of God. That's where the prayer points from heaven will begin to be downloaded into your spirit and your mind will begin to comprehend it. And then there is this deep intercourse that is taking place. All of that is happening. All of that is possible because you shut the door. And if you indeed shut the door, if you shut the door and you arrive at the point of prayer, you know we said yesterday that the point of prayer is different from the prayer point. When you arrive at the point of prayer, when the energy of the Holy Spirit takes over the entire prayer process, the prayer process is no longer at your expense, but at the expense of the Holy Spirit. You begin to glide. This gliding, you can sustain that gliding for as long as you desire to tarry in the presence of God. The greatest profit of prayer is gotten when you want to attempt it for long. Please help me preach to your neighbor, shut the door. And for those of you online, shut the door in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the Bible says that when you have shut the door, then you commune with your father, which is in secret. And thy father which see it in secret shall reward thee openly. So, the, the man of prayer has a secret that exists between him and God. So, men like Simeon that were chief intercessors in the Bible, he came into the temple without a text message, without an email. He showed up the day that Jesus was to be dedicated because God had ordained it before the foundations of the world that the priesthood that would be responsible for Jesus' dedication will not be the Levitical priesthood. And this was the reason why death lost his grip on Simon. Because Simon had a secret from God. And on the strength of that secret that he had received from God, when death comes to his street, death turns backward. He had no covenant with death because he kept a secret that he had shared with God. So he, he came into the temple without a text message. All his age grade people have died. He prayed to die, but death left him. Then he came into the temple by the spirit, the Bible says. And the first thing he says when he sees Jesus, he said, let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. He, it means he wants to die. But death left him. Death forgot him. You want to live long? 
you need to keep some secrets. <laughs> if, God, if God gives you a secret, it's proof of longevity. Lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen the salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. He asked God, let me die now. My, I, what, what, secret, what do you know from your closet? I, do you have a secret? A secret that God came to share with you. He came from heaven and said, Hey, James, I want to share a secret. You live longer when, you, when God shares secrets with you. My eyes have seen the salvation. Because many secrets that God will share with you, he will give you the privilege to see it come to pass. My eyes have seen the salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. So today, the emphasis is come in and shut the door. If you are not disciplined about it, you will never have a prayer life. Come in and shut the door. So that's the summary of what we did yesterday. So when you shut the door, then the things begin to happen in the membrane of your heart. Volcanoes, movements, or songs, spiritual chants begin to flow. Hymns and spiritual songs. You will lose all sense of time because he's going to get you sucked into his realm. When you come out, when he decides to, in fact, he can detain you sometimes. And when he releases you from, from prison, from captivity, and you come out, the devils that were on your case before you went into his presence, the man that is coming out to face them is different from the man that ran into the presence of God. So when you hear the scripture says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run it into it and he is saved. The idea is not to escape danger. It's to go and get fortified in the presence of God so that he can launch you out to face those same things with a higher dimension of God's impartation on your life. And the story of the victory of the believer never comes to an end if he knows how to go into the closet and how to shut the door. That's where wisdom is found. That's where you are inspired to take a direction that doesn't look logical, but it leads to an advantage by the strategy of the spirit. In that place, you cannot be disadvantaged. In that place, your insufficiency is swallowed up and you have what it takes to prosecute destiny. Just like wisdom was crying in the streets, the voice of God is crying to all his elect in the nations of the world. When will you come into your closet? You are feeble, you are weak. Very soon, your insufficiency will be obvious to all. I created you insufficient because in my presence, I'm hoping that you will come so that I can galvanize you with my spirit. For the Bible says that it's the spirit of God that helpeth our infirmities. God created you with infirmities because he wants you to find the help that comes from the Holy Ghost. Shut the door. Hallelujah. The storms can come. The rains can come. I will be before his face. And every time you spend there, it's not wasted. Sometimes it takes you into the past and shows you the, the things that were done in your family line that makes demonic presence hang around the corner. Then he gives you wisdom on what to do, on how to pray, on how to decree things that will change that that mystery and render it powerless then you begin to see patterns that were different from previous patterns because you are beginning to learn how to take advantage of what is in the presence of God sometimes it takes you into the future and shows you things that have not yet come to pass so that he can make you strategic he can make you know when to take your journey 
they can make you know when to stand, when to sit, when to walk away, and when to run. Shut the door. Because God has something to say. Hallelujah. So that's a summary, a, an executive summary of what we did yesterday. Um, we are going to proceed to today. Can you come with me to um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. The lesson for tonight is captured within those scriptures and we will leave about 25 minutes for practicals. So what we are doing now is theory. Then we need to do practicals because the kingdom of God is not in word. The words are weak. And God wants his kingdom adequately illustrated, adequately advertised, so that we all know that we are not wasting our time in church. A serious business to do with God. And we need to repackage God. We need to present God again afresh. Not as a weak God of psychology. Not as a God that just gives us the ability to talk. He needs to be revealed in his true regalia. His true glory. In power and in might. And you will become his agent to make that happen. In the city of Manchester. In the name of Jesus. All right, verse number seven. He said, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions. You know, yesterday, uh, the, the word we had to define yesterday was the hypocrite. For today, it is vain repetition. When you pray, use not vain repetitions as the hidden do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So, According to this scripture, prayer is not informative. You know, <laughs> many of us think that God is not aware. So the reason why you pray is to inform God that you are wrong. The reason for prayer is not information because God already knows what you need even before you ask him. So the question tonight that we intend to answer is how do you engage a God that knows? Because the Bible says your father know it. How do you engage a God that knows? If prayer is not informative, if you are not attempting to, 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 to tell God, inform God, because he doesn't know. So how do you pray to a God that knows? What language do you use? How do you approach him? What are the components of your prayer that can attract a God that knows? So that's the lecture for tonight. We'll do that in the next 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and we'll move to a practical session. Hallelujah. Now, in order for us to engage this matter very, very well, we'll need to digress for a few moments and discuss a subject, and that subject is anxiety. When we come to the main text of the night, you will find the place of anxiety within the architecture of what I'm trying to build, and you understand why we have to study anxiety for a while. And the scripture that will lend us the opportunity to probe into the subject of anxiety will be Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Philippians chapter 4 verse number 6. Hallelujah. Philippians. Chapter 4, verse 6. Verse 6 says, Be careful 
for nothing. NIV, do you have the NIV version? Because the NIV version says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer. Are you, okay, you don't have... Okay, let me open my own Bible. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. It said, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus be anxious for nothing well let us use this example um, okay maybe the well, if it's in Nigeria, one of the major objects of anxiety, the major reasons why people become anxious is because of house rent, house rent. So I don't know how your society is, but let's, let's use the Nigerian example for now. Okay, I, I, from the signs I'm seeing here, it means even here, the issue of... Uh, <laughs> may, the Lord, may the Lord give us understanding in Jesus' name. All right, so let's assume that this is this is house rent. This, this microphone. Are you there? Okay. And then this is anxiety. Hmm? All right. Suddenly you realize that the time for you to make payment is nearing. It's like four days away. And the shape of your account doesn't suggest that you have the capacity to make the payment. <laughs> Hallelujah. When you are in that condition, that's when you'll find out that even though you have a PhD, two PhDs, <laughs> your PhDs have not covered you in that situation. And because of that situation, something that Satan knows will be revealed because Satan knows that you were created insufficient. And that's how God did it, so that we will find our sufficiency in him. So a complete man is man plus Holy Spirit. That's a complete man. A man that has found how to depend on the Holy Spirit is the complete man. He's fully funded. He, uh, he will have access to all grace. He will abound under every circumstance. And he will have capacity to pros prosecute destiny. All right? Now. The moment it becomes obvious that the shape of your bank account is not sufficient to prosecute the demand that is coming from the area of the house rent, you now exercise your mind. Un unknown to you, your mind is insufficient. And that's when it will occur to you that even though you are an intellectual, your, 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 the degrees you have did not change your state of insufficiency. That crisis just came along to reveal how insufficient you are. And the moment you are in that state where you, do, you are insufficient, a spirit now comes to preach a gospel to you. All right? It's the result of the interaction that a demonic spirit has with your mind that anxiety is created in your soul. When this demon comes and sees that you are in a state of incapacity, then the spirit begins to reveal to you how vulnerable you are. Now the day that the landlord is going to kick you out of the house, it will snow that day. Snow. <laughs> You'll be there with your wife and your little daughter in the snow. You create that picture, you flash it in your mind, and then the moment it flashes it, anxiety will be born inside of you. Are you there? Oh, you are not there. Are you with me? So, because this situation reveals the insufficiency, anxiety takes advantage of the situation and plants a seed in your mind. The more, and you see, Satan through anxiety speaks your language. Yeah, he speaks, it's, a, it's as if every, all the realities around the situation are being 
are captured adequately in the suggestions that Satan makes available. And you will think you are the one thinking, but a demon is the one doing that thinking through your mind to bring you to a point of where you accept defeat without a fight. You surrender without combat. So the Bible says, the same way God says, thou shalt not steal, God is saying, be anxious for nothing. It's a commandment, not a suggestion. And he's now telling us that the same reason why you are anxious is the same reason why you should pray. So the accurate response for situations that are beyond your capacity is prayer. This same situation can lead to anxiety. Are you, are you following what I'm talking about here? So this is anxiety. This is house rent. Are you, are you still following? This is anxiety. Now, if, 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 if anxiety takes advantage of this situation to begin to preach to you, when you begin to believe anxiety, the next thing that happens is that anxiety brings in depression. Anxiety knows that it cannot deceive you for long. So it looks for another entity that has more capacity to keep you preoccupied in your lifetime, and that's depression. Depression now comes. Depression enters because you have accepted defeat in the first place. You yielded, so it comes and furnishes a room in your soul with a sofa, and it's just there. And you keep, you keep feeding him. You keep, yeah, so. The more, the more you wander on the part of the depression, the more you, are, you become incapable of exercising your spirit in prayer. So the idea behind depression is to bring you to a point where you are no longer willing to exercise your spirit anymore. Depression becomes a weight that keeps you permanently away from exercising your spirit. So you become Satan's victim because any attempt you make that is not from the spirit cannot arrest Satan. So all kinds of demons, demons of all kinds of appetites are invited into that defenseless environment. And then your story becomes something else. And then you begin to wonder, are you there? From depression, it now brings affliction. Then you, there's a sickness that breaks out of that situation because you lingered in it too long. If sickness comes out of it, the reason for the sickness is not house rent. The reason for the sickness is anxiety. So Satan wants to trap every one of us in the snare of anxiety, and he wants us to play host to depression, to affliction to infirmity, to darkness, to gloominess, to gross darkness. Where demons celebrate on your life as a conquered territory. But the Bible says that the same reasons why you were anxious were supposed to be the same reasons why you should have prayed. Be anxious for nothing. Let nothing drag you here, but in everything. By what? Prayer. And by what? Supplication. Coupled with what? Thanks. Make your request known unto God. Guess what? This scripture doesn't reveal that God came to change the situation. Because when you read verse 7, the Bible says, and the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard your heart and your mind. Stay with me, stay with me. You are not with me. Stay with me. What God does in response to the petition, in response to the prayers that you offered, is that he ministered peace into your spirit man. And the peace was overflowing. So the peace became a barricade for your heart, a barricade for your mind. That means your mind is not available to be influenced by anxiety because the peace of God has come and saturated that atmosphere. It means that your heart is not available for manipulation because the peace of God has secured that terrain. Now in this particular situation, what God did was that God changed you. He did not change the situation.
Should I tell you something? When you begin to exercise yourself in prayer, you'll begin to find out that most of what prayer does is that it changes you. It will change you first. And then you will now say, oh my God, is, is, is the, the landlord is coming. And then the day the landlord now comes, you know, say, ah, oh, well, I had a good day today. <laughs> and I'm willing to extend your time. You see, he changed you first before he changed the circumstance. When you know that, you will realize that there's no circumstance that is so difficult if you are changed. So it depends on you being transformed, not even the changes in the circumstances that you seek. With this refresher lecture, on the subject of anxiety, let's go to the main scripture for the night. The main scripture for the night is in the book of Matthew chapter 6. Stay with me, we want to build something here. All right, Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 25. Matthew 6, verse 25. He said, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. That's anxiety. That's why I had to do that course. I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not life more than meat, and the body than raiment, Behold the fowls of the air. Now, this is what Jesus is attempting to accomplish here is what we call calibration. He wants to calibrate us. You are not with me. Are you, are you with me? Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me for, for 15 minutes. Calibration. You see, when the fall set in, the fall of man set in, the idea of the fall is that uh, man was supposed to be the key that will re regulate uh, the physical creation and when man fell by declaring independence against God in the act of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil creation fell with, with him I don't have time but I, I can prove to you that God did not create any wild animal the lion was not wild in Eden but no time for that it was an ecosystem that was built to reveal harmony not, not fracture, not offense. The same kind of harmony that is settled in the heavenlies seeped into the natural realm. And man was supposed to be the high commissioner of this estate to ensure that everything is within the description of God's intention. So man was the first violator of authority. And when he did that, he rebelled against God and all of creation rebelled against him. That's a story for another day. Are you there? Now, when we go to the day of Moses, Moses came up with a spiritual permutation by which to identify creatures that were clean and creatures that were unclean. And he did this through, uh, by reason of the wisdom that came through his spiritual encounters with God. But you will know that Noah existed before Moses. Is that true? And when Noah came out of the ark, Noah only sacrificed unto God clean creatures. Meanwhile, the nomenclature, the taxonomy of what was clean and unclean had not yet come as at the time Noah was sacrificing clean creatures. So how did he get that lexicon? Where did he get that from? Let me give you a brief definition and then we'll continue with our study. We'll, we'll deal with all those matters subsequently. Then you'll see that prayer is weaved into the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Because men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now, imagine what kind of buses do you use here? Um, all right, okay. I don't know that. I don't know that. Now, in Nigeria, we have what we call the 18 seater buses. You need to visit Nigeria one of these days. <laughs> so, so, 
So we, we have something called the 18 seater buses. All right, so it takes you to the villages, it takes you everywhere. And it's a good means of transportation. And in my missionary en en engagements, I used to do 18 seater buses in the night. I go to the north, to the Islamic territories. And then on Sunday evening, I'm back. And then I'm in my office on Monday. On Friday, I hop. So I did a lot of traveling using these 18 seater buses. If an 18 seater bus, an 18 seater bus can have an accident, can sustain an accident. All right? Maybe the two guys in front, close to the driver, their scores break. Maybe one of the guys at the back seat loses one leg. Maybe some others have bruises. Maybe eight people in the bus come out of the bus clean. No scratch. No pain. Right? Uh, one of those times uh, meanwhile, if you want to use the 18 seater bus, it's better you come early and pick pick a comfortable seat. So one of those days um, I came early, so I got my seat. But you know, my legs are long. There are few options of where you can stay and be comfortable. Uh, so I got that seat and I decided to stroll around. Someone came and moved my bags, moved everything, and took the seat. Uh, and then all the people in the bus sided with the person, so I just kept quiet. And then the bus now has an accident, and then uh, the person that dies, the person on that seat, you know. Uh, I don't like that example, but um, it, okay, things like that happen. All right. Now, the, the question I need to ask is that were they all in the bus? They were all in the bus when the crash took place, but the outcome of the crash for each person, based on where your seat was, was different. That's what happened to creation. Creation experienced a crash. This crash affected some creatures such that they lost touch with the way God intended that they should operate originally. Do you understand that? And for some other creatures, it didn't affect them. So the creatures that that crash did not affect are clean creatures. The creatures that were affected, their manual, they began to operate differently from their manual. A mutation took place. Those ones are unclean. It will, it will surprise you to know that the greatest impact of the fall was on man. Are you with me? So what was happening to Adam? What was happening to Jesus was doing recalibration. Uh, in trying to teach us that we are not supposed to yield to anxiety, he points clean creatures as examples. Are you still with me? Clean creatures still sustain the way they were supposed to operate. By default, they still sustain it. So Jesus is using these clean creatures as examples to point to what existed before the fall. That's the attempt Jesus is doing here. Are you with me? He says, he says what? Uh, verse number 25. He said, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink or yet for your body what ye shall put on is not the life more than meat is not the body more than raiment behold the fowls of the air that's the first example they were not affected by the fall not the fowls of the ground the ones fowls of where then he begins to try to build the case using the fact that this crash did not affect the fowls of the air so let's learn from them. What about them? He said, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into bands. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much more than they? First question. Can you underline that first question? When we are done with the reading, we'll now bring all the questions. The first question is, what? These, these questions are, they are capsules to cure us from anxiety. Some of you are already in so, oh Jesus, Jesus, this, this, these are therapeutic measures to get you out of the hold of anxiety. So the first question there is, are ye not what more than what? The next question. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, second creature. How they grow, 
They toil not. Neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? That's the second question. Can you write, underline it? Oh, they, are, they, are, they are capsules. They are, they are, they are analgesics to administer, to cure you from anxiety. So when I'm about to be anxious, I read this scripture. I am better than they. Huh? Then it begins to clean my mind. Jesus. If we have time, we'll, do, we'll practice mind cleaning with these questions. Because this is how I get myself away from tension. I get myself away from build-ups. And then my spirit becomes light to travel. In the midst of great crisis, I can still stand before his presence. I use this question. Okay. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father does what? I can't hear you. Your heavenly Father what? Ah, you are, you are lost. You, you, you have forgotten where we started. The part I am working on this night is to show you that God already knows. So I'm trying to use this scripture to teach you how prayer should be because prayer is not informative because God already knows. Are you there? So I'm teaching you how to structure prayer. The first thing is that you need to conquer anxiety. Hmm? Notice, it says all these things do the Gentiles seek, but your heavenly father knows. So that's where I'm going. The fact that your heavenly father knows that you have need of these things. Okay, I'm coming. I'm coming. I've jumped to one scripture. If God so clothed the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? This question is not an, an it is not a therapeutic question. This question is a rebuke. O ye of little faith, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of what? Of little faith. It means that if you want to interface with a God that knows, the way you do it is that you have faith in him. So every enterprise of prayer, every initiative of prayer must be faith infused. Because... The only way you can impress God, given that he already knows what you want to tell him, is that you come to him in faith. God has an obsession. And one of the obsessions that God has is an obsession to be believed. The Bible says that he that cometh to God must believe that he is. So Jesus rebukes us for our participation in lack of faith suggesting to us that if we want to interface with a God that knows, it must be by faith. So, if it's going to be by faith, it's not a function of my physical senses. My interaction with God is not based on what I feel. My intercourse with God is not based on what I touch. It is an initiative of faith. The moment God sees that you are coming into that closet with faith in your heart because you know that he will show up. And even though it takes so much time, you still know that he will show up. He will show up because God has an obsession. God wants to be believed. What anxiety takes away from you is the ability to walk in faith. Anxiety makes you travel into the realm of analysis and logic. And so you are stripped of every possibility of walking in faith. When I close my eyes to engage God, I know he's real. Yes. And I'm expecting him to move. It's so powerful. The way I expect him is so powerful that 
even if he doesn't want to move, he'll say, ah, the way this guy is coming, if I don't show up, he'll be discouraged. So he has to show up. I'm coming with a huge faith. Huge. I was in the oil company in Nigeria, and uh, I don't know, we, we need to calculate it in pounds. Um, Dennis, can you calculate 1.5 million naira in pounds? That was my monthly salary. Help me quickly. I need a figure. 1.5 million in pounds. Pounds telling. Let me know what it's like. And then you'll be the judge to know if it's big money or little money. What was your conversion factor? Hey, hey, hey. At what rate? <laughs> now, no, no. For your information, for your information, you need to go back to 2020. That's when, that's when I left work. 1.5 million as at 2020. Do that, do that. Look for the conversion rate. What? So something like $3,303, is that a, a pounds? I don't know, is that, is that money? That's, that's, that's good money. All right. I had crossed all the senior levels, all the senior levels, and I was headed for the management level. If I should write an examination and pass, I was going to be a manager with a big desk, and, and then the, the salary will be 2.5 million. 2.5 million in a month. And my, my housing allowance, as at the time I left, was 15 million. They'll give you 15 million and say, look for a house. So everybody looks forward to becoming a manager. But you write an exam. And I, I, I'm good. I will pass. I know. I know. Even my colleagues know. That, okay, he will pass. Who, who will pass with him? <laughs> so I was warming up to be a manager, big table, so that when you walk in, I'll just be, I'll be swing, I say. <laughs> and then God now comes in the place of prayer, he say, turn in your resignation. I say, my resignation? <laughs> Will it not give glory to you that a manager is your follower? <laughs> What's happening here? I pressed again. It became louder. Turn in your resignation. This was exactly two weeks before the examination that would qualify me to be a manager. And when I was sure it was God, I wrote it out, signed it, and I sent it. I sent it on the on the uh... meanwhile this was how it happened i was going for a crusade going to preach on a crusade and the holy spirit now comes into the vehicle i said what day will your passport expire i said 28 of september 28 of september he said okay your job expires that day too <laughs> okay well on the 5th of october i turned in my my resignation because when I prayed about it I prayed about it I knew it was God so if it is God I don't need to know all the details so I thought the best thing that happened to me in my life was that job that I was working until I stepped out then I saw that God will not ask you to do anything if the harvest is not in view I was a slave when I was in the oil industry I was a slave once you can find faith in that heart, anxiety is trying to fight your possibility of exercising your faith. There are so many possibilities, so many things that you can accomplish if you are willing to engage God by faith. So the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. Huh? Stay with me. 
When you begin to engage God, the Holy Spirit will come to you. And he will furnish the reality of the things he's telling you on your heart. Such that even if he finished, you finish with him and you come out, you know what you heard. It sticks with you. That substance that anchors your spirit, that makes your soul not to doubt, that weight that the Holy Spirit furnishes upon your heart, the Bible calls it faith. It is the proof that the things that you hope for are now existing in the realm of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in the capacity of the Spirit of witness comes to bear witness with your spirit that those things that your senses cannot see are real. The transaction of prayer is done on the currency of faith. And if there is one man in this place that can believe God, then it means there is hope for a generation. Faith. So when you engage a God that knows, know that the only thing that you can do that can impress him is that you engage him by faith. Number two, before we switch to practicals. He said, for all these things to the Gentiles seek, and your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things, but seek ye first. Never put yourself first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Put the agenda of God first. Yes. So a man that is willing, I hope you know even the entire prayer enterprise. Are you there? The entire prayer enterprise, the prayer labors, is done on one principle. That prayer becomes efficacious the moment we begin to engage God according to his will. Eh? Kingdom. We are using our prayer outlet to fast track things that are captured in God's mind. You must know the difference between your job and your work. Because your job pays your salaries, your work pays your rewards. You must understand the difference between your assignment, your assignment, what you are called to do upon the face of the earth, and what you do for money. In fact, if you are wise, you will make money through your job and use it to fund your assignment. If your life becomes aligned the kingdom way, because many people are just church goers now, they don't have any stake in the things that God is building. If God wants to extend his influence from Manchester to Nottingham, they have no business with it. They are just stuck in their ways. They, you know, what they are trying to do is make more pounds. May you not become a slave of pounds. Prayer is supposed to facilitate God's kingdom agenda. Prayer is supposed to be an enterprise that is held up in the atmosphere of faith. These are the two things that Jesus taught in engaging a God that knows. Is that clear? So some of us, it, what we live for, even when I was in the oil industry, if you see my house, the house I stayed in Lagos, you will not believe it was a terrible house. The reason why I had to stay in that house was because I needed to save money to invest in the kingdom. So I, I, I didn't allow my colleagues to visit me because if they visit me, I say, oh my God, you are cursed. <laughs> this is where you stay. Something is very wrong with you. But you see, they cannot understand that I'm not living for myself, I'm living for the kingdom. Pushing the kingdom, advancing the kingdom into villages planting churches in villages. Most of the most powerful things that have happened in my life did not happen under a camera or with a microphone. Demons. Miracles. And they were never captured. There was no picture to capture it. No camera present in the, in the villages. So I have experience with the deliverance ministry. A lot of experiences. A lot. Because I've seen warlocks. I've seen all kinds of witchcraft. Oh, they, they came down under the power of God. Came down. Came down. Came down. 
I've heard witches in Zulu language say you are a dead man. I've heard it in Zimbabwe language. I've heard it in Kenyan language. I've heard it in Uganda language. I've heard it in my language. Say you are already dead. Don't try to survive. You are dead because you are dead. But we are still here. <laughs> We are still here. <laughs> we are still here. All kinds of things. Once you hold faith in your hand, and the reason why you are striving is so that his kingdom can advance. You will have resources beyond what you need on this earth. It will navigate in your direction because it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and the things that the Gentiles seek. Without you seeking them, because you are aligned as a kingdom agent, it will navigate in your direction. Well, that's the theory part. We are going to find him by faith. We'll find him this night. Now, you are going to take a, a posture that is convenient for you. If sitting is convenient, okay, that's okay. If standing is convenient. But, see, what, what I want us to simulate here is an atmosphere that suggests that you are alone with God. Don't allow the person, your wife, distract you. We want to, we want to find him. For he said that if your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. You will have insight. You will have illumination for every aspect of your life, for how to order the children that God has given you. You will know what this one's destiny is what that one's destiny is you will know which schools they ought to go my god there, 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 there will be light so much light in your life so we want to tell god tonight we don't want to walk in darkness we want to walk in the light of light that every aspect of our lives will be overtaken by the illumination of god by the light of god don't allow anybody to distract you we want to travel now we want to travel now. We want to travel now. I want your light. I want your wisdom on every aspect of my being that you'll penetrate my ecosystem, penetrate my life. Oh, plant upon my heart such viable seeds that cannot die. Strengthen me with might by your spirit in the inner man. I seek do not keep quiet make sure you're engaging him trouble 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 the river of the holy ghost that is upon your heart trouble that river trouble it trouble it because when you begin to do business in great waters the responses the feedback that will come will come from the realm of the deep God wants to strengthen you with might by his spirit in your inner man. Rakabos abandelia, 
is of fresh competa mata kota bakata de escapata compati abrai compale mo salavande is coseti anda abrakedo mo samo samo nai samo na kedi samo na kusketa prendo kome la mazude abrai to komba ita besko valamantalia eko baskin tome eso zenaite eso zena zeli mandelia akai kompala monda isko bel saminanto iko baski dobole seketaita makampone sabrokote ba isko mpadwa iabo boseki iabo siso santelia ababa kiso sanukombe Abresco de la mia cantelia, abresco de la bazamina todo, escopelia, escopra manage, escopre que de la, escopre que de la bobosa, escopendo cole, samina y to, y copele casi, así ama, así ama, así se lo bonde, e que en poco me la asunde. I see I see two angels from heaven there are two people here listen to me two people in this place God wants to begin to 
open you up to the prophetic ministry. And there are two angels that have been dispatched from heaven. They'll be bringing revelations to you. You are going to have an encounter now. You are going to have two of those people will be caught up in the first field of the Holy Ghost. Two of them will be caught up in the first field of the Holy Ghost. Two of those people will be caught up in the first field of the Holy Ghost. Two of those people will be caught up in the first field of the Holy Ghost. Two of them, two of them. Holy Spirit. They'll be caught up in it. They'll be caught up in the first field of the Holy Ghost. Vessels is filling up vessels. It's filling up vessels. It's filling up vessels right now. It's filling up vessels. There is someone in the room from this night. When you hear the voice of God, it will be as clear as if it's audible. That anointing is here. And in the next few seconds, it will rest upon somebody. It will, it will produce clarity, clarity. Oh my God, it's coming stronger. It's coming stronger. It's coming stronger. It's coming stronger. Holy Ghost. Now listen, listen, listen to me. Now listen, the Lord wants to open someone's womb. Uh, listen to me, listen to me. He wants to open someone's womb now. Now so do me a favor. Every woman, every, every girl here, can you... Use this hand, put it on your stomach. Just put it on your stomach. Okay? Now, ushers, you will help me, okay? Because I need to touch them. The hand of God will come on them. I want to pray for a minute. So, can you just keep quiet? Everyone, stop praying. Just keep quiet. I want to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, you said you wanted to open the womb of someone. So we ask that you give us a sign. Let fire come upon that womb. So uh, uh, the ushers there, you watch for fire. Let fire come upon that womb. Let fire come upon that womb. Let fire begin to intensify. Let it begin to intensify on that womb. Let fire begin to intensify. Let it begin to intensify. Let it begin to intensify. Let fire come upon that womb. Let it be, yeah. Let it begin to intensify. Let it intensify. Let fire come upon that womb. Let it intensify. 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 
So, Osas, you help me. The Lord opens the womb. He unstops the womb tonight. He breaks the chains tonight. Bring that person here. Someone you lost your spiritual gifts and the Lord is restoring your spiritual gift right now. It's restoring your okay. Yes, it's the gift of prophecy. The, the gift of prophecy. Um, it's coming, it's coming back, and the anointing will come upon you in the next 12 seconds. In the next 12 seconds, Father, in the name of Jesus, that one that you are restoring the gift of prophecy on his life, on her life. From my left hand side to my right hand side to my left hand side to my right hand side to my left hand side to my right hand side holy ghost 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 holy ghost
Jesus. This is such a significant moment. Father, we thank you for the unlocking, the unblocking. We thank you for the release of your presence. We thank you for every miracle. We thank you for every pilgrimage you've taken in the spirit and you've brought us to new destinations in you. We give you praise, Lord. We will keep mounting up. We're not going back. We're going to be advancing. Advancing in the spirit.